Welcome to Ed's Not Dead. I'm Robbie Dodd. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Peter Crable. Hey, what's up, Robert? What's up, man? Good to see you. Thank you. You notice I'm wearing a hat today after you've been blasted on my uh, terrible hair recently? Well, I didn't. I know. Mr. Crabs, you, gr- you have a great head of hair. I, I would never dare to make fun of your hair. Tell me more. Tell me more about my great <laughs> hair. <laughs> well, it, must be, it must be very frustrating that you can't get a haircut. <laughs> it is, actually, yes. I don't know what that's like. I was thinking about going to some state capitals with a sign that said, I need a haircut, but... I was busy that day. You are. I, I do notice you're getting some. You're getting some wolfies around there. Oh yeah, it's starting to stick out. And oh, you know, it's bad. Is yeah. it also, it's yeah. also like when you start to get that. Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna say like the kind of upper neck hair weirdo. Yeah. Hair. It's all fuzzy and stuff. Yeah, that's called that's called milk toast. <laughs> that's what we used to call that back in the day. When it starts to curl up around the back of your ear, yeah. that, uh. that's, that's milk toast. All right, and my. Fellow bald compatriot, <laughs> Mr. C. <laughs> Hello. So Hi, good to Ed. see you guys. Good to see you. Pleasure. There was some there's there's some latent anger coming from you towards me in the pre-show meeting, I could tell. No, it's just you know, I, I can throw mud right back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're glad to have everybody. We got a great show tonight. As always, you can find us at Ed's Not Dead PC on Twitter and visit our website, edsnotdead.com. Uh, Mr. Siddons has a very compelling blog post that he's working on right now that I two. saw I saw on the Google machine today. You got two in the hopper. Two in the hopper, ready to go. They just need to be edited by Mr. Krabs. Very nice. Yeah. I guess not by me. I don't. I don't edit. Well, I I, no, I, I read the I read the one today, start to finish. I know, and I was honestly I was pleasantly surprised by that. It looked good. I was sitting in my truck and I I read the whole thing. I like it. I was surprised to see your name pop up in the in the document. Honestly, I was like, "Whoa, you've got a lot of sources in there." I was impressed. Yeah, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to step up our game, our blog writing game. Very good. Um, and then I shared mine with you. I know. I need to read it. It's nothing to write home about. It's an op ed. <laughs> it's like a Washington Washington Post style op ed. I just called it that to make myself feel good. Hey, whatever works. Um, (laughs) Ed's Not Dead is brought to you by Pulp Education, a full service educational media company specializing in leadership, instruction, and 21st century school reform. All right, fellas. So tonight we are going to talk about uh, the future of public education and what it's going to be all about when we come out of the COVID-19 crisis, whether anything will change, which I imagine it will. Yeah. Reopen schools. Yep. And um, any any of the things that we're doing right now, are they going to stick? So we've got a couple of really interesting articles. Uh, one recently in the Washington Post, under pressure to reopen this fall, school leaders plot unprecedented changes. And then a much more detailed piece, how to reopen schools, a 10-point plan uh, that's really focused on equity um, and the needs of special populations of kids. So we're going to get into those. But first, as always... Show feedback. Show feedback. So uh, we, we did get a, a five-star rating from someone that Robbie knows, I think, or is a parent uh, that closely connected to him. The, the, the comment was, as a parent, I have appreciated all of your insight and humor as you help us unpack current issues and trends. I especially appreciate your views as fellow parents and the empathy you employ as you highlight the diverse needs in our county, such as food insecurity and special education needs. So that was an awesome piece of feedback. Keep it coming. You, you give us feedback. We will read it. From M. Begaris. M. Begaris, that's right. <laughs> M. Begaris. And uh, I, I, I spoke to my – another piece of feedback, I, I spoke to my cousin the other day. He lives down in Miami, and he owns a farm called Sleepy Lizard Farms. It's an avocado farm. And uh, he used to work for Siemens, which is a uh, technology a technology company, a German tech company. And he worked for them for 20-some years and then um, ultimately decided to leave the company and buy a farm. Um, and he messaged me on Facebook. We talked about this article back in September from the Washington Post. And it's, it really talks about how do, we, how do we work with and speak to and communicate to our parents and he, he wants to continue the conversation. He's a listener, too, which I didn't know. And he said, uh, he said he wants to talk to us about the concept of trying to please a parent. 
It's something I used all throughout my sales career, but not the same way you use it in an education where it's literally a child and a mom. And uh, we had a great conversation about what does that look like and, and how far do you go as an educator and a, and a parent to, to further that communication. So that was really great feedback from my cousin. You know, he's kind of my hero. He's, <laughs> he's living my dream of like uh, an, an agricultural second career. Yeah, and, and he's, he's got a very popular YouTube channel um, that you, you both need to check out. Uh, he videotapes his, t his fishing that he goes on. He's a big fisher, fisherman down in uh, the Everglades. And uh, he brings my uncle Tommy down there, and he is an absolute, absolute. riot. And uh, it, it, they look like every Siddons ever, so you'll know that they're absolutely yeah, so this, this is your dad's side? My dad's side, and you will know immediately that oh, we he's, are. He's, he's a character that I've met. Huh? It's a, wait till you see the videos, because <laughs> they are hysterical. Um, so anyway, um, I also, I don't have, it's not another piece of feedback, but I wanted to share with you all a letter that one of my students shared with me, um, about quarantine that I think a lot of teachers and, and our fellow school staff members are feeling. Um, so if you'll, if you'll be so kind, I'm going to share this with you. Um, Melissa from my skillful teacher class, she said with the quarantine happening right on the day before we were supposed to meet. I've just been processing and taking one day at a time. I felt a ton of things. For the most part, I'm grateful. I've had the time to reflect and focus on self-love and self-care. And especially grateful, I have the privilege of social distancing with at least my basic needs met. My solidarity stands with families who are currently struggling with this reality and with the workers that are on the front lines from the nurses, the doctors, the grocery clerks, warehouse workers, mail delivery drivers, etc. This reality is greatly impacting the way many people look at how we function within this system. And I hope we don't go back to that kind of normal. I'm hopeful this moment will evolve to some kind of change that works for the majority of society and not just an elite few. So thank you, Melissa, a very uh, young teacher, has a long career ahead of her, but she's really an amazing personality and, and I'm sure an amazing teacher for her kids. Very nice. That is, that is, that is some high praise there. And that's our feedback. <laughs> and that's that. <laughs> that's that. End of that segment. <laughs> it was it's very warm and glowing show feedback this, this go round. Well, uh, we only read the good ones. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no shots at me or any of us. That's good. No, no. We, we really haven't gotten that kind of negative feedback yet because we're, we're fairly, we're fairly benign fellas. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it's an industry to go out and be offensive and that's true. you know upset people and um, there's I actually read something about how some uh, some current sort of like f internet or online figures started off as pretty benign, um, non consequential, non controversial, and then they were like, "Well, I'm not getting enough viewers or listeners," and so they just pivot to something totally insane. Just and then all of a sudden, boom, their you know their popularity skyrockets or whatever. It's all about starting a troll factory. There you go. Um, we've had our moments where we'd, we'd like to be more controversial, but we'll, we'll stick with the current formula, right? Yeah. Just a couple of buttoned-up nerds. <laughs> education, education nerds. All right. Well, speaking of that, uh, Mr. Krabs, we have time before our first break to try to get in this segment on the future of public ed uh, post-COVID. Yeah, we're going to solve it in uh, 15 minutes. All right. Great. And let's let's get into it. Um, you've you've hit me with a, almost more than I can handle in in trying to summarize two pieces. So I'm only gonna I'm gonna start with the first, which is the um, simpler, less detailed article in the Washington Post. Sounds good. Um, under pressure to reopen this fall, school leaders plot unprecedented changes. Uh, it's by Valerie Strauss, Laura Meckler, and Moriah Belinja. Um, it is uh, a fascinating piece in that it's starting to spell out how school might be different come August slash September, um, because the the deeper we get into the spring and the more the restrictions, uh, longer they exist on on us and on gathering, the more it looks like school systems are going to have to make changes. Um, my guess is, and you probably agree with me, that that systems all across the country right now are already planning for these things. That's what these articles say. But just a few examples. 
a new landscape that in- could could include Mr. Siddons, you love this one, one way hallways. <laughs> Because <laughs> we know you're the champion of one-way stairwells. That is an inside joke that no one will get. Okay, but you did laugh, and it was funny. That was good. Uh, kids and teachers <laughs> in masks and lunch inside classrooms instead of the cafeteria. Buses may run half empty, and students may have their temperatures read before entering the building. Platooning kids, which I think will happen, uh, where half the kids come to school on uh, certain days and that you have some component of online learning in there. Um, it even goes as far as having kids sitting in one direction in classrooms, which is not a lot different than what they do right now. Uh, (laughs) Right. This is true. This is true. Yeah. Um, there really is no other way to see children other than Rose. So exactly. So that everybody will be used to that. But, (laughs) um, as, as the president and others in certain part of the country, push to reopen the economy and organizations and, and schools. Um, what do you guys think of how systems are going to deal with, uh, with restrictions that may still exist to some extent or another? Yeah. You know, I, I, I hate to be sort of like a, a, a Debbie downer or whatever, but when I, when I read a lot of these suggestions, my first response is no, 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 not going to happen. Not plausible. Um, Because I think the one thing that underlies almost all of this is it all costs more money. Mm -hmm. And we have been, as a country, very reluctant or downright um, in opposition to giving schools more money. Um, Coming from the federal government to states, we've talked a bunch on the show about how different municipalities deal with it. Uh, Some schools are severely underfunded. And when you start talking about more bus routes, when you talk talking about smaller PE class sizes, I saw something where uh, keeping schools at, or I'm sorry, classes at like 12 students, you know, it just doesn't seem plausible when you combine that with the fact that states are going to be faced with historic revenue shortfalls. You know, where is that money coming from and where is the work coming from? Um, and I think, Robbie, to your point about you think that platooning is, is one thing that's going to happen. So I, I think just the thing to think about there is, you know, for families, it, it's partially to keep kids safe, right? But the whole point of sending kids back to school or a big portion of it is so that parents can go to work. And if you have a kid in high school and a kid in middle school or any combination, what if your kids are platooned on different days? You know what I mean? Then you have kids all the time at home and is, a, is like a working parent. It really doesn't help you at all. Yeah. So... Yeah. You know, a lot of the a lot of the points I just I'm like I, yeah, it, it sounds great, but to me it's a little bit of a a false sense of a security and not realistic because you need money to do all those things and and what do they really do they really make kids in schools safer in terms of virus? Yeah, and I think um, you make all very valid points, but I think it's going to ba- be based on the the states that um, come back first. So in the states where governors are pushing people to go back to work and pushing people to go back to schools, schools are going to have to be flexible and districts are going to have to be flexible to do these things. However, even if you do cohorting, even if you do split schedules or smaller class sizes, or even temp- taking people's temperature at the door, it doesn't matter because they're going to transmit the virus. Kids are going to transmit it. Teachers are going to get sick. Students are going to get sick. And even in that example of taking one's temperature, they're not even clear that it actually tells you whether or not um, someone is in the uh, someone has the virus and is able to communicate it. The other piece for it is I'm thinking even further down the road about what about state requirements for courses to graduate? Uh, Maybe instead of having you, you maybe they actually start taking the steps of saying, well, instead of four years of English, you need two years Um, or, uh, instead of four years of social studies, you take two years or a combination thereof with online learning. Um, and schools are going to have to be flexible based on the, the departments of health in their states. But ultimately, there's not a really good choice because, like Crable said, uh, the amount of money and funding it's going to require is just going to um, go through the roof. Well, I mean, there is a for, – for cohorting, as you call it, Mr. Siddons, I mean, there is a – there is an analog for that back in the, back in the past. Um, 
it, it was a pretty common practice in the 1960s and 70s when schools couldn't keep up with with building schools. Yeah, my, it, my mom had a cohort when she yeah, was in well, high they, school. Yeah, in Montgomery County, they called them double sessions. Right. That, that was a really, uh, in fact, one of your, your, your alma mater, Sligo uh, Junior High School, ran on double sessions um, for, for a while because it was so big. Right. Uh, but what does that look like? I don't, how does that work? Well, you would have, you basically have kids go to school. You'd have two sets of kids going to school each day. Um, and, 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 and to that point, like, I think that's going to help at least mitigate some of it. But at the end of the day, if you look at the graphics and the, and the explanations of how this virus travels, it, it does not take more than one person to spread it to hundreds of people in a matter of hours, if not minutes. So then what's the answer for both, both of you are uh, a little bit doom and gloom as far well, as what an- can be done or, or just realistic. Are we going to be online fully again in the fall? The, the answer is I think most districts will be back in school by the fall. But what you're going to see is all these kids and teachers are going to be out of school and sick and schools are going to have to pull back and close school again. That's what's probably going to happen. And um, there's this uh, researcher who's uh, for the New York Times who calls it the dance. And basically, like, you, you, we're going to find that states are going to pull back or are going to start opening businesses very, very quickly, too quickly. And they're going to be forced to pull back because people are going to start getting sick. And they're going to have to go in and out, in and out until they figure out really who is infected, A, and B, who already has the virus and they're not the federal government's the federal government certainly isn't doing a job at that. And, and many States aren't doing it as well. And we don't have enough tests in general. So. And, you know, I think, and that's the thing to your point, Robbie is, I mean, at some point schools are going to reopen. And that's not a question of if, but just a matter of when. Um, but I do think that some States will be more aggressive in opening and then we'll kind of see what happens. But I think what, what will be especially interest, interesting is in states that are unionized or districts that are unionized, um, because I think there's a really a chance for uh, teachers unions to flex their muscle here. If teachers, let's just say it's next August, next September, if teachers by and large are like, you know, nothing's changed, like it doesn't seem safe, I don't feel safe, you know, do they flex their muscle? And they're like, we're not coming back to work. Like, we're not there yet. Um, and that can be a play where you just have state by state really disparate solutions to the problem. Some stay all online, some are going back to school. Um, but it's, I mean, we're going back to school at some point. I like the ideas, and not to be all doom and gloom, I like the ideas of all the things they're saying. We've talked about, um, you know, what sort of long lasting changes will come out of this smaller class sizes, um, better hygiene. I mean, these are all things. Uh, that are good for schools as a whole, and I would love to see them happen. I just don't know if the monetary and political will 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 actually be there. Um, I mean, I I don't know. I've been I've been pretty impressed with the response um, of school systems in this crisis, uh, and I I I tend to think that. Um, I mean, Casey's point causes me pause because I, that would be, to me, a worst case scenario. Which one? Send, <laughs> send kids back and then you had to pull back again. Um, I think that's a guarantee. Yeah, I, it is. I mean, it's possible. I just, I mean, I wonder then if you don't try to um, continue online in, in for a little bit longer. Yeah, um, and use the summer to try to create a more robust online platform to right. connect to, to to help kids, um, because it would be, I think it would be a major calamity to get kids back into schools and then to have to do it all over again. I, I if I were a system, I would want to avoid that at all costs. Yeah, yeah. But can you imagine for a moment meeting new students for the first time online? Yeah, I can. I mean, I did it for four years as a doctoral student. I yeah, did, I, I, I did. Like, I'm talking about like 11, 12 year olds, middle school kids. You're trying to build relationships with kids. You're not going to be doing it over Zoom. Well, the, the, I know. But again, I mean, I, I feel like a broken record on this. 
that doesn't that speak and I'm not trying to be critical Casey but doesn't that speak to to us hanging on to what a brick and mortar school is it, this is not that so our notions about what schooling is right now have to change yeah relationships are not going to be what they are in a brick and mortar school they're going to be different yeah um, and so we have to accept that and make the best of what those relationships are all about. Yeah. I mean, kids are doing that right now. I mean, my, my 16 year old, you know, really only had in a block schedule, not that many courses in the third quarter classes in the third quarter with, with his second semester teachers. Yeah. Um, yeah. so, so by the time this is over, he will have spent most of the semester with, you know, interacting with these teachers online. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's working to some extent. All right. Uh, we have time to go into how to reopen. No, we do not. <laughs> that was a, that was a, that was a very higher level uh, notification on a legal <laughs> pad held up to the zoom camera. <laughs> All right. Uh, what we will save, fellas. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, our, let's put a pin in this conversation. Okay. This this 10-point plan, though, how to reopen schools, a 10-point plan putting equity at the center. I love it. Yeah, I love Great. it, too. We'll, so we'll come back to that. Uh, we uh, have to go. And <laughs> when we have a great, great interview coming up, Andy Hargreaves. When, when we come back, we will have Andy Hargreaves, who we're so psyched about. He's a huge thinker um, in education. So don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back. Dr. Andy Hargreaves is a research professor at Boston University and visiting professor at the University of Ottawa. He's been working for decades to improve school effectiveness. He has been awarded visiting professorships in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom, Hong Kong, Sweden, Spain, Japan, Norway, and Singapore. He is also the past president of the International Congress for School Effectiveness and Improvement. Dr. Hargreaves founded and serves as co-president of the Atlantic Rim Collaboratory or ARC, a group of nine nations committed to broadly defined excellence, equity, well-being, inclusion, democracy, and human rights. He consulted with numerous governments, the World Bank, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, universities, and professional associations. He's written more than 30 books and received numerous awards for them. And he was the founding editor-in-chief of the Journal of Educational Change. How are you, Dr. Hargreaves? Good to see you. I'm very good, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. All right. Well, um, this is a big get for us, right, fellas? <laughs> oh yes, very yeah. excited. Yeah, we're we're excited. All right, so let's jump right in, uh, Andy. You recently wrote a piece for the London Times that was also picked up by our very own Washington Post that highlighted 19 do's and don'ts when it comes to strategies for everyone teaching their kids at home. That would be me. Um, walk us through some of the ideas that um, really resonated with you or you might think are more important or those that you've got the most positive feedback from readers. Sure, sure. I'd be delighted to. The, the first thing I want to say to uh, anybody listening is uh, these 19 strategies are not a 19-point plan. I don't <laughs> think any, anybody ever in history produced a 19-point plan, and if they did, none of us would remember it. As we do this, let, let's pick up uh, Three things in particular about about schools that stand out. First is anybody who thought schools were a bad idea, anybody who thought schools were dead, anybody who thought the the uh, online learning was was the future and everybody could learn off their iPhone and, uh, and and schools will be for the few people who were left over. Anybody who thought they could put education out out to a market and make it a free for all, I think they're really thinking <laughs> about this again. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah. Especially as we come back in September, we're, we're going to have, a, uh, a, a, I think, a really refreshed view. Uh, first of all, schools are, frankly, they're places, they're places to put kids <laughs> so their parents can go to work uh, <laughs> at, a, at a very basic level. Um, boy, have we been realizing that in a, in a huge way. Um, the other alternatives, you know, we can put them in prison or we can put them in warehouses or or what we've decided to do for over 100 years is actually to put kids in school so the parents can go out and do something else. That's the first kind of really basic thing. Uh, the, the second is, is schools are places of care and community. And this is, uh, this is really important. 
um, you get care in schools from another adult as well as your parents. Uh, so sometimes in the most tragic cases, it's actually instead of your parents. So if you're in a very vulnerable family, if, um, if, if there's violence or domestic uh, abuse, if there's a fighting over custody arrangements, if there's extreme poverty, uh, so sometimes the kids will get the care in schools that they're not, that they're not getting in home. And, um, and they'll also get community in school. So school is a place where you learn to uh, take your turn, listen to others, uh, sit, sit, in, sit in a circle, uh, 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 cooperate and connect. Get along with people who are a bit different from you as well as ones who are uh, the same. And, and the third thing, of course, is the learning, the learning related to uh, technology as well. Mm-hmm. And people ask me a lot, um, what will be the transformation with technology and learning once all this is over? And my answer is, strangely, there'll be more technology and less technology. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we're going to see. Mm-hmm. I think where, where we're going to see more technology is um, we're experiencing through this the massive inequity of access to technology as a way to enrich learning, to give kids access to uh, other ideas, to Khan Academy, to other ways of teaching things, uh, to uh, even you know, Noodle that you can dance to and do physical education, uh, many, 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 many platforms. And so I think one of the things we're going to see with more technology is uh, more states, more regions, more countries saying, okay, we, we need something like a big hub for everybody, uh, where everybody gets access, everybody has it as a right and as an entitlement, and um, and uh, this is not mainly about machines or platforms or right. uh, digital programs. Yeah. Where we're going to see less t- less technology, I think, is uh, through the idea which Diane Ravitch has already pretty much punctured, that the online schools and uh, online courses are, in general, at school level, better than face-to-face teaching. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that sometimes they're not useful, not helpful. If you're in an isolated rural area, you want to do a photography course, you probably can't do it in your school. So <laughs> you know, it's better to be able to do it online than probably not do it, not do it at all. Uh, but, but, but in general, the idea that, 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 that teachers can go the way of the dodo <laughs> and, uh, and we can have online courses instead, um, mainly the evidence is that's already not working. And I think this is really highlighting the enormous problems uh, that there'll be if we think that we can have online courses for place teachers. So you mentioned um, clutter (laughs) and confusion, which is what I'm feeling a lot of uh, right now. Um, And specifically, uh, you know, in in the home environment and, you know, you write about uh, some about how parents can be involved and intimately involved in their child's learning um, so, you know, speaking from personal experience, I have three kids at home yeah. and I'm an educator yeah. <laughs> and so I feel like I should, I should be hitting it out of the ballpark. Um, but like many are, are struggling to find the balance between the yeah. demands of a job and, um, wanting to continue to have my kids learn and love yeah. education and all that good stuff. So how do, how do you suggest parents manage their time between the demands of learning opportunities for their child or children, as well as the demands of their job? Well, I, I, I mean, the first is understand that, you know, lots, it's not the same boat for everybody, but, 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 but almost everybody is in a challenging position here. Um, I don't know what the portion is in, in America, but in, uh, uh, in Canada, homeschooling normally is about one and a half percent of the population. Mm. And, and homeschoolers are uh, usually people who choose it on ideological grounds or religious grounds. Or, uh, or because they want to protect their kids in some way from things like bullying and so on that they might be susceptible to. There's almost always one parent at home uh, full-time to, to be with the child. So you can't just scale up homeschooling uh, and what people do with homeschooling to the population at large in this, in this kind of crisis. Right. So it's always going to be difficult. It's always going to be imperfect. And as a parent and as a child, understand that perfect is the enemy of good. <laughs> and um, and, uh, and in terms of the support that you get from the school, uh, then, then it's easy to say, but what you want is something that's enough, but not too much. 
And in terms of the support you're giving your kids, you are enough but not too much. Don't mm -hmm. don't try and race through the curriculum. Don't uh, don't try and, and do every complete every piece of chemistry that's needed for the next grade that the kid will go into. Right. Don't try and get to the exactly to the level of proficiency that the kid's supposed to be at. Because I think when schools come back in September, they're, uh, uh, they're going to figure out uh, what they can continue to do and what they can leave without it devastating the rest of a child's yeah. the rest of a child's life. What your child needs from you, I think, is uh, as a parent, uh, and what I try to remember when I'm with, with my grandkids is they need love, they need attention. Sometimes they need a bit of discipline and a few boundaries and reminders. They <laughs> absolutely need that. They need some kind of schedule, some kind of order, so that every day is not totally unpredictable compared to every Every other day one or two worksheets is okay there's there's nothing criminal <laughs> about you know doing a few mass problems but if you're doing worksheets all day you're probably in a school district which uh which is actually about this time of year not doing any learning at all but only <laughs> doing test prep yep. and uh um, and memorizing stuff that the kids will quickly forget so one or two worksheets is fine don't feel don't don't feel guilty about that so support and care for your kids Involve them in the conversation with you, even your five-year-olds. Let them know, let let them let them know what's going on. Make decisions about uh, broadly about how you're going to approach things, what your days, what the rules are, what what your day is going to look like. And um, uh, playing out is important. Other countries do it a lot more than the U.S., so this is a way to catch up to other countries in terms of how much opportunities kids get to if they can. You know, to play out outside, even if it's like on the balcony or on the stairwell or, or, or wherever it is, um, and then try and have a, at least one thing a day that you'll do with them, which is like special time, uh, and that is uh, that it that is absorbing. It might be a craft activity, it might be a kitchen science experiment, might be uh, might be something you look at uh, on, uh, online together and uh, and engage with online. So that, the, the, the broad answer is enough, but not too much. <laughs> and, uh, and, and don't feel guilty about what, you're, what standard you've not reached, what you've not, what right. you've not got to. Um, and, and try and keep the kids connected with the friends. So, you know, if they've got devices, they might want to FaceTime their friends from time to time or Skype them or, you know, whatever, whatever you use. Uh, but, but also understand it's tough for everybody. Talk to other sure. parents. Um, you know, support each other um, and, and talk to your teacher, you know, make contact with your teacher and have, and try and get the teachers to talk to each other as well. Yeah. So, you know, they're not all sitting in their foxholes, <laughs> so, uh, send, sending out with the best intent, loads of stuff for the kids to do. Right. And I'm hoping in the next two or three weeks now that teachers have uh, kind of got onto what they can get out to the kids and to the parents that they can connect with each other um, with these dots joined up are overwhelming the parents or overwhelming the kids it, with stuff that's landing on the plate. And it's, it's funny, it's, it's interesting to think about it now because even the parents with the most means and the supports and the education, they're certainly struggling, but they're doing, a lot of folks are doing what they can, but you're also seeing a lot of backlash, at least on the Twitter sphere, about, you know what, this is just too much. And yeah. like we're literally li living through a pandemic, and yeah. I, I think your 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 approach to it is 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 totally totally perfect. But I, I you know we always think about the students who are uh, who, who have the least or are coming from yeah. low income backgrounds. Yeah. What are some things that we should be doing systematically to help our most vulnerable students? I'm, we assume that we're, there's going to be a lot of backtracking when we get back in the fall. But what are your yeah. thoughts and, and ideas on that piece? Uh, well, well, well so some of this is to give the, the parents, if they can, to give them extra help for uh, for the kids. Uh, I, I do want to say one thing which, which connects with, I'll, I'll talk at the end of this about uh, my memoir about a working class childhood and uh, social mobility and, and inequity. Um, because being working class is often associated with uh, with poverty, and we've seen that with a lot of our essential workers. We're really learning like what the working conditions are for a lot of our essential workers now. And after this is over, I think and hope we're all going to think a bit better and, uh, and, and a bit differently about, about what our essential workers need. Right. And, and, the, and they may not have money, but it doesn't mean they're clueless. 
um, and it doesn't mean they have things from their culture to give their kids. So, sure. Uh, so many kids are in poverty, but it doesn't mean they have nothing, and we should behave as if they have nothing. It, it's to help the parents kind of give what they can to their kids. Some of this may be as simple as um, uh, dropping off materials on their doorstep, uh, crayons, pencils, erasers, sure. um, uh, a glue, tape, uh, paper, um, well, like simple things that that all help the kids have things to work with, things things to do, uh, games like secondhand games, things things like these. Um, uh, I, I think, but particularly, these are the kids that that teachers need to prioritize in terms of their own time and their own contact. Yeah. So, so it, it's uh, being a teacher now where you can make contact with families is, is not about uh, treating all kids equally. Sure. Um, in, in the sense of giving them all the same time. Um, it is just like it is in a classroom. It's uh, some kids need extra time, extra help, extra attention. That's where your learning support teachers come in, where, special ed comes in where your counselors come in and so on. And as a team, you need to make connections with these kids, help, help uh, support them. Uh, perhaps do a lesson online on a Google Hangout or right. a Google Classroom and not do it with the whole class, but perhaps just do it with a small group of kids who really need that if they've got, if, if they've got kind of, a, if they've got the access to a platform. So it's uh, again. It's a really tough problem. We're working in circumstances far from ideal, but 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 uh, give the most help to the kids who need it most. Yeah. All right, we're um, we're getting short on here, time here, Andy. I want to. I'm going to try to combine t- two questions in one here. I while we have you, um, I you know we don't we we never want to let a crisis go to waste. So yeah. h- how is I, I'm really curious about how um, this awful time that, that we've all experienced um, might indeed change public education, at least in the United States. Is there anything that will stick? Is there, we know it's kind of a notoriously hard institution to change. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to be curious to see whether anything is different when we come out of this. Yeah. And, then I, and then if you could go into telling us about um, your memoir, Working Class Background. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I think I think when we come out of this, one of the first things we'll realize is that, that this this experience is a huge window into what schools are normally doing at, at this time of year. So I, I've seen and heard of everything from uh, teachers actually doing really creative lessons online, teachers giving their kids access to uh, really great platforms, teachers helping their kids undertake. Uh, uh, of all ages undertake uh, investigative projects. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I've also heard of teachers giving their kids F grades. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, get, please get a life. <laughs> right. Uh, to, to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> teachers getting obsessed about driving to the end of the course. Yeah. Uh, and um, and teachers just sending ditto sheets. And, and that is, you know, let's not blame the teacher here. It's usually the system that has typically got teachers into that that mindset. So uh, I think the first thing we'll learn coming out of this is that uh, it, it's a window into school, and, and, and where the schools are doing well, the teachers will get even more appreciation than they normally get. Um, and where it is all about ditto sheets, more parents are going to wake up and say, what is going on here? And it, it'll be schools change not when professionals put the pressure on. They change when parents and the public Put the pressure on. <laughs> yep. Um, I think the second thing we'll see coming out of this is that um, uh, probably by the time we're out of this, there'll be no teacher uh, in any part of the developed world who is able to say they don't know how to do some kind of online learning. <laughs> It's true. Or, or, yeah. or yeah. remote learning yeah. or, yeah. or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So we've got a new baseline where, where, where everybody is. Everybody has knowledge. You, you may still not like technology or some aspects of it, but you'll like it from a standpoint of knowledge rather than a standpoint of ignorance. And so I think we're going to get a much more intelligent conversation about technology and learning driven by the idea of learning, not by the technology. Um, and I think on hope that we're going to get the public and public systems more engaged in this rather than just putting it out to to private 
private market yeah. forces and, and options and so on. So I, I think uh, I, I think that's that's going to be a really big change as well. I think the third thing is in general, um, uh, well, we're going to really value our teachers again <laughs> after this. Uh, in general, we're going to come out of this thinking totally differently about health workers, construction workers, uh, people who work in the grocery stores, yep. um, or cleaners, and, and, and we're going to come out of this thinking differently about teachers. And, and we have to make sure as a profession that, that we don't look, lose that and that we keep that connection between the public and, and, and the teaching force. Yep. Um, and the last thing which connects to my memoir, because you asked me uh, about that, I've no idea how many minutes we've got uh, left. We, we have about three minutes left. Go ahead. Oh. Three minutes and 27 <laughs> seconds, I have I wasn't going to give um, you the second. I have, I have another Zoom uh, session are, set up if you'd like to do that. <laughs> uh, it's it's going to be okay to say you're working class again. You're going to be you're not going to be ashamed to say you're working class. You're not going to see being working class as something you have to get away from. At the moment, it's the only identity people are supposed to leave behind yeah. to be successful. You're not supposed to leave behind being immigrant or a person of color um, or an African-American or LGBTQ. Uh, you're, 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 they're marginalized, but you're also encouraged to take pride in those parts of your identity, like being Native American. And uh, we've tended to treat working class as something that people should leave behind in yeah. order to become something better. And we need to pick up on the fact that um, working class will come back big time because of essential workers and because we're going to bring some of our manufacturing back mm -hmm. home because the global supply chains have been ridiculously vulnerable in mm -hmm. this crisis. Yeah. So manufacturing is going to come back. doesn't mean more steel mills and cotton mills and so on again, coal mines, but, 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 but the dignity of, of work, the dignity of labor, the dignity of work will, will, will come back. And we should talk about that in our schools. Yeah. Um, we should, if people want to move on, become middle class, great. But, but, but make sure you don't have to leave behind who you are yeah. in order also to be something else. You can be Mexican and you can be American. You can be both. You, you can come from the working class and keep a lot of that and be middle class as well. And if you want to follow this, then please read my memoir uh, coming out in uh, June called Moving a memoir of education and social mobility about all these questions uh, related to my own working class childhood in the north of England, how it affected me then, how it affects me now still in what I advocate for, and, um, and how that connects to the literature of the time then and now of awesome. uh, equity and social mobility. Wow. Well, that, Dr. Hargreaves, it's been an honor to have you on Ed's Not Dead. Thanks for making some time for us. And, um, we hope your your family and you remain safe and well, and um, we uh, we look forward to the memoir coming out in June and, and getting you back on the show at some point. Same for you. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Best best of all to your teachers, your kids, and uh, and all their parents and carers. We'll get through this. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you so great. much. Welcome back to Ed's Not Dead, folks. Thanks again to uh, Dr. Andy Hargreaves. It was awesome having him on the show, wasn't it, fellas? Yes, it was great. Oh, yeah. An another, another huge get by C.H. Siddons. <laughs> Mr. Siddons, remember, we're, this is radio, and they can't see the faces you're making. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so you have to use I'm just very excited for the next segment. You are. It, is it, there's a quiz. It's a quiz. All right. Uh, any 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 last thoughts about about our friend Andy? We are so glad to have him on the show. Um, he was very generous to give us his time, um, and uh, I think he's a, just a very thoughtful guy about what our education system is going to look like in the coming weeks and months. And um, I thought he was just really great. Yeah, it was good to hear multiple perspectives on um, schools, what schools are, what schools are going to be. I thought even. How we kind of started in terms of the, the function that schools uh, serve was pretty interesting. I never really thought about that. It was like, oh, it's just a place where people go to learn, but it's really serves a much more important societal function than yeah. just teaching and learning. 
Yeah. So all of us can actually work. Yeah, it seems pretty important. To support our he's, fans. He's, he's our first uh, Brit on the show. Indeed. Yes, he is. Yeah. I, I liked. I liked how um, you won't find anybody that's more more pro teacher than Andy Hargreaves. I, yeah. I, I, Agreed. Yeah, I mean, he really talked about what a critical role teachers are playing and should play in the future once we get back to. Uh, whatever the new normal is. All right, Mr. Siddons, uh, I'm a little concerned about this quiz. I saw the title of it in the show notes, and it, get, it gave me Don't pause. worry. Don't I, worry. Don't worry. All right. uh, given the recent inexplicable shortages of paper products, specifically toilet paper, Robbie and Peter are going to duke it out over who knows the most useless information about this humble household item toilet paper you ready i feel good about my my prospects here i, I don't know, know. I, I think i have a question in here that well i think i'm gonna win because i know crable is a crumpler and i'm a folder <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the questions that was part of the draft but i took it out crumpler. <laughs> there's also a question here that will we will get robbie very excited about, <laughs> it, about his growing up all right um, go ahead. let's go all right number one the use of toilet paper has been traced as far back as the sixth century in which country a, China, B, Russia, C, Chile, or D, England? I'm going to go with A, China. I'm going to go with Russia. Correct answer is China. In 1393, while medieval Europe was still wiping with rags, wool, and hay, the imperial <laughs> court in Nanjing was documented to have used 720,000 sheets of toilet paper, each uh, sheet roughly two to three feet. The Europeans size. were using hay? You know it. Oh, yes. That's, that's the emperor problem. of Nanjing and his family alone used 15,000 sheets of a particularly soft and perfumed type of TP. Very important. The, 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 Ch- the Chinese were always ahead of the curve there. And, and Yes, they were. Yep. All right. Number two, the first commercially available toilet paper was made from which natural material? A, cotton, B, hemp, C, oak leaves, or D, rayon? I'm going to go with uh, hemp. Oh, come on. I'll go with uh, bamboo. (laughs) (laughs) The correct answer is B, hemp. (laughs) Whether it's been with leaves, corn cobs, or pages of the Sears catalog, people have been wiping long before toilet paper was available or popular. It was a New York man named Joseph Gaiety that invented sheets of aloe-infused hemp in 1857 that were specifically meant for cleaning up our nether regions. Thanks, Joe. You know. So it had it had aloe in it. That's a nice touch. Right, right. Yeah. So in, another interesting t- tidbite, a, f- a, t- uh, tidbite. <laughs> a, a tidbit, a few decades later, uh, Clarence and E. Irvin Scott popularized toilet paper on a roll, but the embarrassed brothers didn't claim their innovative new product for years because they, they didn't want to tell people about it. Got it. Number three, toilet paper used to have blank in it. A, aloe. B, bleach, or C, opium, or D, splinters? I'm going to go for bleach. I'm going to go with uh, sandpaper. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Uh, I'm going to go with aloe. You just said aloe. Ah, uh, D, it's splinters. Ouch. <laughs> Today's toilet paper is noted for its softness and smoothness with fancy additives like aloe and lotion, but that always wasn't the case. It used to be far more rough and coarse, and early production techniques meant that you could be in for an unpleasant surprise. Like the Lodge of Protest, you just said the first commer- commercially available toilet paper had aloe in it. I know, but this is my quiz, so get over <laughs> it. Robbie got the point, even though he answered wrong. He answered wrong, too. Uh, number four, in late 1973, this late-night talk show host helped touch off a toilet paper shortage. Was it A, Johnny Carson, yes. B, Merv Griffin, C, Dick Cavett, or D, David Letterman. I'll be different and go with Cavett. The answer is A, Johnny Carson. He joked about toilet paper potentially running out after reading media reports about a pulp paper shortage. And then his audience, wary about shortages touched off by the OPEC oil embargo, cleared the shelves. Very nice. Number five, this one will... will, uh, I was five. In 1973? Yep. Well, you know it well. Number five, this Charmin spokesperson appeared in more than 500 ah. commercials for the brand. A, Mr. Whipple, B, Mr. Dipple, Mr. C, Mr. Wiper, or D, Mr. Glasses? A, Mr. Whipple. The answer is A, Mr. Whipple. 
He appeared on over 504 ads during the 20-year span. What did you say, Crable? I said I had no chance. I said, yeah. <laughs> now, Mr. Whipple was huge. I mean, he faded by the 90s, but he was huge in the 70s and 80s. What did he look like? That is he, a good He question. was a nice old man with glasses and gray hair. Yeah, I, yeah he looked like Burl Ives or somebody. <laughs> Number six. You guys don't even know who Burl Ives is, do you? No, no, An no. An old no. dead dude. An old dead man. <laughs> The average American uses how many rolls of toilet paper every year? Is it A, 30, B, 40, C, 50, or D, 100? 100. I'm going to give Crable the, the, the benefit here because he's so far behind. What did you say, Crabes? 100. What, is, what were the other choices? 30, 40, or 50? I'm going to go with 50. The answer is 100. The average American uses 57 squares of toilet paper every single day. Americans. Hey. So wasteful. So here's here's a, here's a the, the next two are, are the last two are challenging. It's an ongoing fissure in bathrooms around the world. Do you hang the toilet paper roll over with the loose end on top or under with the loose end closer to the wall? True mm-hmm. or false? Hanging with rollover is more hygienic. True. Uh, yeah, true. I'll go with true. Answer is true. There's more chance with the other way that your dirty hand will have to touch unused portions of the roll. I, 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 I do prefer under, though. Why? The, That's crazy talk. I, I, I've, always, I've always thought that over, it's harder to find the end when you're beginning a new roll. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you just spin it like this. <laughs> <laughs> Problem solved. All right, last one. Eight, there is a yearly toilet paper contest where folks compete to design this outfit made entirely of toilet paper. A? A tuxedo, B, a wedding dress, C, a pair of pants, or D, a dress shirt. Wedding dress. Wedding dress, yeah. Correct. And the bride wore white, indeed. <laughs> An annual TP wedding dress con- contest sponsored by Char- Charmin Weddings and Quilted Northern challenges TP creatives to design a wedding dress using nothing but toilet paper, tape, glue, or a needle and thread. Did you just call it Charmin? I was going to say, it's... I, it says Charm Weddings, so I mispronounced it, and I thought it was Charmin, <laughs> but it's Charm Weddings, which is a different, uh, not a toilet paper company. <laughs> oh, Charmin, you make the Charmin. best. Charmin. That was one of your best quizzes ever there. Well, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. I, I, I always am nervous about presenting my quizzes i thought i thought i thought for sure you'd have a question about maybe like the genesis of rolling people's houses <laughs> that's good <laughs> that's good i don't know you didn't think about that i didn't is that still a thing oh absolutely yeah yeah that why, is- hasn't you, why, is, why hasn't your house gotten rolled yet oh it looks like what i know what i'm doing in the weekend that's a good question I, I can tell you the house that i grew up in got rolled frequently yeah, was my- your dad no, because of my brother, older brother and sister. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, maybe it was just the, I don't know, was rolling happening when you guys were in high school? Because it was big in the 70s and 80s. No, not really. Yeah, it was associated with swim team a bunch. And then yeah. and then I feel like at some point in high school, some people got like really into it or something. But I, I don't think that lasted very long. <laughs> yeah, ro- rolling and egging, those were, those were the good tools. <laughs> Uh, I've never egged anybody's house. That seems, no. it, right. seems like, it seems like crossing the line. No comment. Um, <laughs> what, have you ever done was a ding ding dong doorbell ditch? The flaming oh, we bag. Were, we rang people's doorbells. Yeah. Have you ever done a flaming bag of poo? No, no, that I can't even believe <laughs> whether. <laughs> Is that a real thing, or is that just people, the people do that? I don't yeah, know. That's a real thing. People really do that. Yeah, apparently, that's, that, that's a real thing. And 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 back in the day, knocking people's mailboxes over, like in, in um, dazed and confused, that was that was a thing. Also, I never did any of that stuff because I knew I would get caught. So, yeah. Well, some of that stuff is fairly destructive. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think about right. that, I don't have a mailbox, but if somebody destroyed it, I would I would be rather upset. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, the, there was a guy on the corner that lived on the corner of of the street on my as you entered my neighborhood. Um, that I think that the turn where you came into my neighborhood, um, maybe it was that people were under the influence, and it was the seventies, and but uh, people 
routinely took out his mailbox. <laughs> oh no! And so uh, eventually, he he put like a so six-inch that- steel girder <laughs> in the ground, Jeez. concrete. And my dad always used to comment on that he was afraid, you know, that, I mean, it was, su- it was such a steel girder that it would, I mean, it would have split a car in half <laughs> if you hit it at full speed, but that's how angry he was. Wow. Um, all right. I have a new segment that I didn't tell you guys about Oh yes. before we get off. Okay. Yes. Uh, it, it's a short segment, uh, three minutes. You each get a minute. Um, so it abides by Mr. Crable's time limits. Uh, what are we watching during the pandemic? Uh, starting with you, Mr. Sids, what are you watching? Or let's do this. What are you playing? Oh man, I'm doing both. So I finished Red Dead Redemption 2 only to find out there are two more chapters of the game. So I get to play it for another 40 hours and I'm watching Fixer Upper because I'm nested. <laughs> and, and you, and you, and, are, you are in full early thirties, new home, new home owner fixer upper mode, and and seeing all the stuff that I can't afford. And you know what? I told Jenny uh, on the phone the other day. I said, uh, Joe and Chip, who are the hosts of the show, remind me of Jenny Dodd and Robbie Dodd. Oh, really? Yeah, and she was. I think she was excited to hear that. Okay, I'll have to check out Chip, and I'm like Chip. You're like Chip. Oh, sweet. All right, good. Okay, well, those sound like good ones. All right, Mr. Krabs. Um, So I've been playing a bunch of this game called One Night Werewolf, and it's a sort of like card-ish game. It's like a role-playing game where every round lasts, you know, two or three minutes, and uh, there's werewolves, and then there's other characters, and everybody has their face down, and then you perform various tasks with their eyes closed, and then you basically lie to each other to try and kill the werewolves, or if you're a werewolf, not be killed. But it's fun to watch a six and a four year old uh, try and lie to you about what they were. Uh. <laughs> and they're like, I, I was, I was, I, I, I was. You're like, okay, you're lying. <laughs> uh, so I've been playing, playing a bunch of that with the kids, and then uh, actually started watching The Last Dance. Um, the Great show. Series, yeah, um, about the the Bulls, the '97, '98 Bulls. So. Uh, that's been fun to sort of relive uh, some of my, my formative teenage years, preteen teenage years. Just How about those suits? I said to Jenna, I said the, the most unfortunate thing about this entire episode is the baggy trash bag suits oh, they're all wearing. Terrible. Oh, man. Like they all, they would, they would, they would just look so much cooler with just um, a less, uh, a less like uh, dated look, I guess. And, and one of, one of Michael Jordan's bodyguards has hair. The blonde curls. I don't know if you saw those. <laughs> Ouch. Oh. It was so cool at the time, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I bet. Yeah, it was so cool. All right. Yeah, those are good. Okay. And I, I'm, on, I'm on the third Game of Thrones book, A Storm of Swords. Nice. Whoa. Uh, 800 pages. So I've been reading that very slowly. I can Jeez. only do a chapter or two, and then I have to put it down. Um <laughs> watching uh clone wars which by the time this airs may be over uh because the last two episodes of the last season are Ooh. tomorrow night and monday night nice. may 1st and then monday and then uh like you two i um well i watched the draft obsessively and then um uh i just can't get enough of the last dance yeah it it, it takes me back and it's just been Great, great TV. I, I like, I, I think Michael Jordan is saying, just remember LeBron, who, who's the greatest. <laughs> that, that's what I think his point in the whole thing is. Yep. I've been surprised how honest uh, he has been in particular. Yeah. Because I feel like, and maybe I, maybe this is totally off base, I don't know, in, but that he's always been pretty careful with his public image. Oh, and, you, um, you, know, you know his famous line, don't you? No. Repu- Republicans buy sneakers too. <laughs> I mean, that that's what he said when people asked him why he didn't take more more. Well, he wasn't more of an activist like predecessors like Bill Russell and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and and figures like Muhammad Ali. Right. I mean, he was he was accused all through his career of being just a, a, a you know totally driven by commercial interests. Yeah, yeah, and the the thirty years on feud with him and Isaiah Thomas and the Pistons. Oh, I'm like, Oh man, oh, 
It's amazing. It's 30 years ago. It's so good. How, it's how egregious. Like Isaiah Thomas is completely unapologetic for, <laughs> for how he and his teammates acted and, and totally beat up the Bulls. Yeah. They, they they did, but having been there, you know, I remember watching Isaiah win the national championship in 1982 at when he was at Indiana, and I, I think there's been some there's been some interesting other perspectives on telling Isaiah's side of the story. Yeah, and unfortunately, in Isaiah being such an antagonist, um, his greatness has been overshadowed. Yeah, because uh, he was a great player. Yeah. Um, and, and they were a great team. I mean, they were, you know, they beat, the, they beat the Bulls, they beat the Celtics, they beat the Lakers, they beat everybody. Yeah. yeah. Um, back-to-back so, champions, that's, you know. Yeah. So, anyway, all right. So, there's that's what we're watching, folks, uh, if you have any interest in. I thought, Crable, next you'll be playing Dungeons & Dragons and Magic the Gathering. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe I will. So, what? Uh, <laughs> I'm not, I'm, it's not great. Uh, yeah, so Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> hey, Dungeons and Dragons is hip after uh, the famous uh, Netflix show. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Whatever the show was called. Stranger Things. There you go. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yep, yep, brought it back. All right, folks, as always, Ed's Not Dead is brought to you by Pulp Education, a full-service educational media company specializing in leadership instruction and 21st century school reform. You can always find uh, us at Ed's Not Dead PC on Twitter. Check out the website, edsnotdead.com. Um, Mr. Siddons will have a couple blog posts up there soon. So will you. They, yeah, they will be compelling reading. Um, send us show feedback, please. We will read it on the air and spread the word about the show. Boys, I hope uh, all your families are well in the weeks to come. And Thank you. Once again, thanks to Andy Hargreaves for joining the show. All right, fellas. We'll see you soon. Adios. Adios.